Did any conference add more talent via the transfer portal than the Big Ten? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Thursday. Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are your co-hosts. I'm Andy Patton. He is Isaac Shade over there. You are joining us at the place to get your college basketball content every single day, five days a week, 52 weeks out of the year here on Locked On College Basketball. Special shout out to those everyday listeners who are hanging out with us each and every day. Special shout out again to those of you hanging out with us in our Discord channel. It's free to join. Link in the show notes on audio and video platforms. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Well, we are continuing Transfer Portal Week here on Locked On College Basketball, talking about the Big Ten Conference today. It is a big conference full of big talent. We got a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of talented players to talk about today. We're going to talk first team all Big Ten. We somehow narrowed down all of the transfers to five players. We'll talk about them. We'll talk about who missed the cut. We'll talk about the classes that we're ranking in the top five in the Big Ten in terms of transfers for this upcoming season. We'll talk about a team that didn't even utilize the transfer portal this offseason, what that might mean for them. And we'll close out the show with some superlatives, best fit, most likely NBA draft picks, sophomore breakout, all sorts of fun stuff here as we talk Big Ten hoops. Isaac, this was this was not an easy task in any capacity. We started a list to whittle down the transfers that we wanted to pick for our top five. And I believe our list got whittled down to 23. And then we had to pick from 23 players to get it down to five. Why don't you tell us who we ended up going with? And we can talk a little bit about uh, some of those guys who maybe just missed the cut there. It's funny, Andy, we were talking about on yesterday's show how in the Big East it was very guard heavy. We Mm -hmm. found as we were putting this list together, it was actually very big heavy, front court heavy. And it ended up being that way with which makes me realize how much fun it's going to be to watch post play in the Big Ten this year. Yeah. For to which I guess is not really an outlier for mm-hmm. the lumbering Big Ten as we think about it. But right. there you go. Number one on our list coming to us from the Pac 12. Now the Big 12 <laughs> is Umar Balo transferring from Arizona to Indiana. This was one of the first big names, if I'm remembering the, the uh, timeline of it all correctly, to commit. At yeah. that point, we were like, holy cow, Umar Balo got a million dollars to go to Indiana. And now that kind of mm-hmm. seems like chump change for a player of his caliber. Mm-hmm. But that is the top player on our list. Just one of those traditional bigs. He's not a guy that's going to step out and do it. He's going to just bang around in the post for um, the, the Hoosiers this year. And Andy, we stick with another big that's moving out to the West Coast, or, mm-hmm. you know, kind of staying out West a little bit. But uh, going to the Big Ten at the same time. Yeah, great. Asabor is our next pick here. And you mentioned for Umar Balo, uh, the, the, the the money not looking like exactly what we thought it would be. And that's in part because of great Asabor, who gets that $2 million paycheck. It was a huge storyline when it happened. He follows Danny Sprinkle for another time. He started with him at Montana State, followed him to Utah State in the Mountain West, now follows him to the Big Ten, heading out west to Washington. Uh, Great Osborne is going to be an incredibly, extraordinarily talented player for this Washington program. Very interested to see how everything comes together for UW in general this year, uh, the first year post Mike Hopkins era. But Great is going to be a great piece of that team uh, heading into next season. And then we we go with, uh, this is kind of one of the few non-bigs on the list, although he's not certainly not a, a point guard the way that most of the Big East list was, and that's Frankie Fiddler going from Omaha to Michigan State, uh, 20 points per game last year at Omaha. Tom Izzo uh, seems incredibly resistant to utilize the transfer portal, but I think looked at his roster and realized the need for a a wing of this caliber. Uh, I'm really excited to see what Fiddler is going to bring to the Spartans next year. Yeah, and he should be a lot of fun, and and it's cool since he is uh, Izzo's only transfer, and -hmm. that makes it kind of all the more intriguing to me to see what he will do on this list. Number four, we come back to the bigs, and this is one of the biggest bigs out there coming from FAU. 
is Mr. Vlad Golden. Speaking of following coaches, he's yeah. coming up to Michigan and following Dusty May there. We we know of his exploits as they burst onto the scene a couple of years ago. The Owls did. Going to be very excited to watch that. And then, Andy, the last player on our list here is Michi Johnson, who leaves South Carolina to come to Ohio State, who has multiple players. Uh, we, we like their class a lot. You'll hear more about that soon. But really think he he could be a great piece here for the Buckeyes. So, Andy, that is our top five. Umar Balo, Great Osibor, Frankie Fiddler, Vlad Golden, and rounding it off with Michi Johnson. Yeah, I really like this list. And I think one of the rules we've had, for those of you who have been listening to the show, is you know we're trying to pick one player from different programs. We don't want to double up on, on programs. So that did help us narrow down the little the list a little bit of like, okay, if we're going with Balo, then that means we're not going with Miles Rice. You know, if we're going with uh, Vlad Golden, it means we're not going with Danny Wolf. Like so, and, and for Ohio State, we basically had all four of their players uh, in our top 23, but we ultimately decided Michi Johnson was the name we wanted to go with there. And, and so you see a lot of programs that have these really great overall classes. I'm very excited to kind of get to that part of this conversation, but with with a conference that's so big with four new schools coming in that obviously changes the equation here but it is incredible how many players i mean the the amount of players that we did not just talk about who are going to be really good next year who are going to be nba players who are going to be potentially all big 10 first team second team caliber players like we, there's there's a a litany of talented players in this conference who are newcomers next year and and like you mentioned the the how great watching the bigs in the big 10 is going to be and yeah we're talking about post Trace Jackson Davis, post Hunter Dickinson, obviously post Zach Eady, which is the big one. Like there are so many great bigs who have just recently departed the Big Ten. And yet we're going to be watching this conference this upcoming season with guys like Balo and Golden and Osibor and many others who are just going to be incredibly fun to watch next season. Yeah, Andy, I, that is a great point. There's all these guys out the door and yet we still have so much coming in, so many guys sticking around. I, like, and I think this is part of the bloated conferences that we're getting, mm. especially, you know, it's funny. We've tomorrow's show folks for just for your heads up is the sec. Mm. And Andy, we've already acknowledged you and I have that, that that's going to be a difficult endeavor as well. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. Like, I think even more difficult than the big 12 was for us. And I'm wondering if this is where we're starting to see that higher money, starting mm -hmm. to become a factor both in the Big Ten and the SEC. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say for certain that it is because really this is the first, I, I would say the first cycle where we're really starting to see it separate yeah. from the others. And so I, I'm curious to see in the next couple of years, but like thinking back to our ACC show or the Big East show, obviously the Big East only has 11 schools and only 10 mm -hmm. of them have transfers. Um, but like even with the ACC, which has the same number of schools as the Big Ten, I feel like we just didn't have the same level of, of talented transfer classes like we're looking at here with the Big Ten. Yeah, and I think there's there's a, a handful of factors. Absolutely, the money is, is part of it. But I also think we're, we're talking coaching changes, which tends to invigorate the fan base to potentially toss some more money uh, at those programs. So you're seeing some bloated NIL collectives and bloated amount of money going into programs at, at like Michigan or, or Washington, where they're probably not going to have 2 million to throw at the, at one player very often at UW, but they're, you know, because they know they're joining a new conference because they know that the, uh, they're going to get more annual revenue. So the money does play a factor for a school like Washington, but I think also uh, a new coach kind of invigorates the fan base and that they can kind of feel more comfortable tossing some extra money there. That's the case, uh, you know, at Michigan, I think you, we knew Eric Musselman was going to utilize the transfer portal the way that he always has uh, since it's been a thing. And so that combination at USC combination with the new conference totally makes a lot of sense. Mick Cronin whined and whined all last year about not having enough money and we can laugh at him for doing that, but clearly it worked because they brought in a bunch of talented transfers. Oregon has Nike money uh, that they have always been able to utilize. They have one of the best NIL or one of the best transfer portal classes on the football side as well, because they have, have the ability to, to do that. Uh, and so I think there's kind of a, a handful of different factors that have led to this, but ultimately it's a conference with a lot of money. It's a conference with a lot of new coaches. It's a conference with a lot of teams. So I'm not surprised to see a, a really stacked star-studded group uh, of players joining this, this league. 
All right. Multiple factors at play there, Andy. We move from talking about individuals to classes. Which Big Ten class tops our top five transfer classes and which school didn't grab anybody? We'll get to all of that in just a second. Right after I tell you about game time, going to MLB games in the summer is one of my favorite all-time things to do. The game, the food, the people, everything that goes into making it a great experience. And I'm excited to make those same types of all-new memories this summer at the ballpark. And thankfully, I don't have to sweat high-priced last-minute tickets because game time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. In fact, Prices on the game time app, they actually go down the closer you get to first pitch. So with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. And Andy, one of the things for me as I think about it is I often worry about like, man, if I buy these third party tickets, are they going to be bogus? Great news though, with game time ticket coverage, your purchase is covered by the most flexible customer service policy in the entire industry. I love that peace of mind. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Terms apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Thanks so much for joining us today on Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And if you want to hear more about your team or your conference, you can go check out Locked On Big Ten or any of these great shows. Obviously, a lot of them right now, as we're at the beginning of August, are talking football, but there will be certainly basketball conversations coming into the conversation. I got a feeling that our, our our number one team on this list probably still talking basketball on his show, even as football season gets underway. A little bit of a teaser there for you. You know what, Andy? That's exactly where my head was at. I love how we uh, <laughs> great minds think alike all the time. Yes, because Andy, while we have a top five uh, class list here, an honorable mention, and we're going to talk about the one school that didn't take any, Andy, you gave us some nice foreshadowing. Who is it? It's Jacob Goins at Locked on Hoosiers. Indiana is our number one class in the Big Ten. And look, I am going to I'm going to go ahead and say this. And if it ages poorly, it ages poorly. I'm not super in love with this class. Having said that, we I still believe that is the best transfer portal class in the Big Ten. And we talked about how great this class is. So or this overall conference transfer portals were so. I still am a believer. I'm just, I'm skeptical. I guess that's the best way to put it. I'm skeptical. Part of it is skepticism about Mike Woodson. Part of it is skepticism about just the overall fit of these players in this system and with the other players currently on Indiana's roster. But Umar Bala was one of the best bigs in terms of low post back to the basket, rebounding, rim protection, scoring around the rim. He's one of the best in the entire country. He's been one of the best for many years. Um, so he, if that's what the kind of player that you wanted at Indiana, he absolutely fits that bill. Again, I think with Malik Renault, with McKenzie and Baco, like I'm, I'm a little, I'm not sure that the fit works as well there as it might have worked at some other programs. Uh, and then when you look at the other players they're bringing in, and Carlisle from Stanford, Kanan Carlisle, you get Miles Rice from Washington State, talented players not really shooters. And I think with them coming in, with Mbako having not really shown a consistent ability to space the floor, it's less about the talent for Indiana because I do think talent-wise, this is the best class, uh, at least pound for pound. I mean, it's hard to compare to like USC has like 32 transfers coming in. So I don't know how you compare those two classes uh, exactly. But for Indiana, I think the talent overall is is really good, and Luke Goody is a is a is a three point shooter. They did get some floor spacing in the portal. I think you know. Shout out to Woodson for for going and getting him from Illinois. But I'm just a little concerned about how all the pieces are going to fit. And we talked about this on an episode recently where we talked about uh, coaches on the hot seat. And for Woodson. I th- we may still be a full year away, but getting a really good transfer portal class almost puts more pressure on him because if you can't utilize this talent and make the pieces fit, uh, I can tell you right now there's going to be some folks in Bloomington who are going to be really calling for a, a new coach to take over if this doesn't work. A big part of that, Andy, you know, like with Luke Goody, who comes in, mm-hmm. great shooter, 
I don't even know if he's in the starting lineup. Yeah, right? Really like, I, think, right. I think we're expecting him to come off the bench as he did at Illinois. And so that plays a role in this too. Number two on our list of the Big Ten transfer classes is USC. And Andy, we've talked a lot about when we're ranking these classes, quality and quantity. This one's a little bit of both, but it's definitely quantity. Yeah, um, We've got 11 transfers at USC as a reminder until the transfer or until the scholarship rules change right now you get 13 scholarships mm -hmm. 11 newcomers here for the must bus at USC reminder that that's all part of the uh coaching carousel started by SMU uh that made this offseason as fun as it interesting as it was got several interesting players Des Claude coming over from Xavier who we're really excited about um St. Thomas from Northern Colorado Northern Colorado just pumping out uh, these dudes, you know, we had Dalton Connect last year mm -hmm. going from Northern Colorado to Tennessee, ends up getting drafted lower than we thought he should be. Yeah. But, you know, probably the runner up for National Player of the Year behind Zach Eady. Mm -hmm. St. Thomas is a guy that that's going to get some great noise. We'll talk about him more in this show. Wesley Yates at Washington is a guy that didn't play last year that, that we're really interested to see what he can do. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's more, but I just wanted to highlight uh, a couple of those guys, Andy, that we think is part of this second ranked Big Ten transfer class. Yeah, really, really fun class here. I'm very interested to see how the pieces fit together. You have some high scoring mid major guards like Bryce Pope, Clark Slatcher from Penn. You have a, a defensive focused prospect that I'm really intrigued by in Kevin Patton Jr. coming over from San Diego. Uh, like just just a ton of talent uh, coming into to Mus's program. And again. Uh, if we have a, a bit of skepticism about how the pieces fit together for Woodson in Indiana, I think it's fair to have some skepticism at USC, uh, in part because a bunch of transfers joined Eric Musselman last year at Arkansas, and it didn't really go all that well. There were some other issues there, it sounds like, but I'm interested to see if we see a pattern start developing of Mus bringing in a bunch of transfers and maybe the pieces not all coming together. If it works, it's going to be great. If it doesn't work, it'll be a, a potentially rough first year uh, for Musselman in Southern California. Number three on our list is Michigan. Dusty May, great class coming in, headlined, of course, by him being able to bring Vlad Golden over from Florida Atlantic. He certainly, he certainly tried to bring over John L. Davis as well, was unable to do so because of Michigan's fairly strict uh, admissions process. That has been an issue for the Wolverines for the last couple of years. Dusty May found that out early in his tenure, but pivoted, still managed to get Vlad Golden, goes out and gets Roddy Gale from Ohio State, goes out and gets Danny Wolf from Yale, who's fantastic. Trey Donaldson, a nice upside pick from uh, Auburn. There's a lot to be excited about. Sam Walters from Bama, Ruben Jones from North Texas, just to round out that class, because really all of them, I think, are worth mentioning. And I think uh, it's, it's a new era for Michigan, and I think they're off to a really good start with the pieces they've brought in the portal. Sam Walters is somebody under the radar that I'm really excited about. He really added a lot to Alabama last year. I'm excited to see what he does. I'm also very interested to see if Golden and Wolf can play together in the yeah. front court. Andy, Michigan's bitter arch rival, the Ohio State Buckeyes, is the next team on our list. And Andy, this is... Um, if we're talking about USC as quantity, then I guess we can't talk about a four player class as quantity, mm -hmm. but man, the quality is really good with Ohio yeah. state. And what's I, I'm intrigued by each of these four players for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Aaron Bradshaw, Sean Stewart are both guys that are coming into their sophomore years out of blue blood programs. Obviously Bradshaw from Kentucky, Sean Stewart from Duke with Bradshaw, you know, there were the injuries to start last year. And we often see this where, uh, a freshman who's dealing with injuries often has struggles getting fully in and incorporated. I, I think Bradshaw man could be primed for a big year for coach Diebler. Michi Johnson has already shown it at the high major level at South Carolina. We think he should be a dude. And then Micah Parrish just kind of does a little bit of what you need in a variety of ways. Obviously we've seen that at that for the Aztecs the past couple of years at a very high level. Obviously the Aztecs have made it to some of the highest levels of college basketball while he was there. He knows how to win. He knows what that looks like. That's huge for coach Diebler. Yeah. I, this Ohio state class is maybe my favorite in all of college basketball, at least very high on the list. You laid out perfectly why, so I'm not going to relitigate any of that. I think it's an incredibly intriguing and potentially very, very good transfer portal class for Diebler and the Buckeyes. Number five on our list is 
the Washington Huskies new coach, Danny Sprinkle over there. Of course, great Osibor is a huge part of the reason why, but there's other great pieces here as well. DJ Davis from Butler, Makai Mason from Rice, our two guys I think are going to have a big impact. I'm a huge fan of Tyler Harris coming from Portland to Washington. Tyler Harris was a really good freshman last year for the pilots in the WCC. Uh, there's some other pieces here that I think are, are going to be really productive right away. Chris Conway from Oakland, uh, Casey Ebequi from Oregon State. Like there's some, some Lewis Courtright from Rhode Island. Don't want to miss him. There's some excitement in this Washington class, not just great Osibor. I don't know if Washington takes a huge leap, especially going from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten, but people projected Utah State to be not very good in the Mountain West last year in Sprinkle's first year, and he had them at the top of the standings Great there. Point. I don't think Washington wins the Big Ten, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do better than people expect them to under Coach Sprinkle. And then, Andy, the team that just missed the cut was USC. I think if it were not for Great Austin. UC, UCLA. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did I say USC? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I've just got LA on the brain. Andy, UCLA is the team that just misses the cut. In particular, we really are curious to see how Sky Clark, Eric Daly, and Kobe Johnson uh, mm -hmm. come together. But obviously, Tyler Billadou coming over from Oregon State, Dom mm -hmm. Harris from uh, Loyola Marymount and William Kyle from South Dakota State round out that class. And Andy, similar to what we talked about with the Big East yesterday, there's only one other school in the Power Five conferences that got zero transfers, and that's Matt Painter's Purdue, Purdue Boilermakers. And it's kind of similar to what you talked about yesterday with Marquette, where you lose a Zach Eady, you mm -hmm. lose Mason Gillis off to Duke, mm -hmm. um, but you're keeping several guys. you got a big incoming freshman class. And so mm -hmm. consequently, uh, Purdue just doesn't really have room to bring anyone in from the transfer portal. Yeah, not super surprised. Purdue didn't make a big move here uh, because of that, that freshman class they got coming in. They lose Kanan Catchings late in the season. He decides he wants to, to explore other options. But at that point, there wasn't really an option to – for Purdue to really find anybody worthwhile in the transfer portal. So I'm not really surprised we didn't see moves from Purdue. Um, I wasn't shocked we didn't see moves from Marquette either. But again, <laughs> both Matt Painter and Shaka Smart are very, very good coaches. And this is going to be a really interesting year to see if their strategy of not utilizing the portal, which again, they are very unique in that regard. We will see how that kind of pays off for them. But I'm not going to be surprised if either of these programs have really good years because they have talented returning players and they have really good coaches. Isaac, we have talked the best transfers in the conference, as many as we could, at least. We've talked the best transfer portal classes overall in the Big Ten. Now we want to talk about some superlatives. Which Big Ten transfer is the best fit at their new program? Which player is most likely to get drafted? Some other superlatives all coming up to round out the show in just a second. The first, today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by eBay Motors. Folks, passion, drive, patience. That's the formula for winning championships, and it's also what helps keep your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your car every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, folks, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that W. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. All right, Isaac, rounding out the show here, talking Big Ten transfer portal superlatives. we got a handful of different categories. We're going to move through these with one player and one honorable mention. We'll definitely uh, just want to want to lay this out here before we get into it. We're trying to not talk about players we've already discussed at length in the show. So we're going to try to bring in some new programs, some new teams, some new players. Uh, if they were on that first team, if they were one of those five players, we're not including them here. Yes, Great Osibor would be an obvious example for best up transfer coming from a mid-major to a high major, but we already talked about him, so we're not going to include him in that conversation. Let's start with best fit. The pick here, we're going back to that USC transfer portal class. Desmond Claude, really great fit in, in Eric Musselman's system. He's a high-scoring guard. He's not a great three-point shooter, which we'll see how that impacts uh, his potential role for the Trojans, but... 16 points a game last year at Xavier. I think he's in a great system that's going to utilize his skill set well. Uh, for the must-bus and the Trojans. 
Yeah, Andy, that's a great pick there. And then our runner-up, Sky Clark. And um, man, you know what? How else can Mick Cronin replace Tiger Campbell uh, from a couple of years ago? But with a guy that's got very similar hair, had a little, uh, you know, fine freshman year at Illinois, really mm-hmm. did well for, again, a struggling Louisville team last year. I think he could be a big uh, addition for UCLA. Andy, we move along to our best up transfers. You said we're not using great Osborne. So our choice here is Danny Wolf mm-hmm. going from Yale to Michigan. We can't use his uh, front court mate, Vlad Golden. And so Wolf is a great option. Really curious to see if they can play together. As I said earlier, last year at Yale, 14 points a game, 9.7 boards. But I love that this big seven footer dishes out Two and a half assists a game, shooting 34.5% from three, Andy. Really interested to see how Danny Wolf does for the Wolverines. Honorable mention here was Josh Cohen at USC, uh, coming over from UMass, very talented player. And the reason he's the honorable mention and not St. Thomas is because our next category is the most likely NBA draft pick. And again, trying to go with guys we weren't talking about previously. That means we're picking St. Thomas here from Northern Colorado to USC. Could Northern Colorado twice in a row, send a player to a Power 5 conference and then have that player subsequently get picked in the NBA draft. It looks like a very distinct possibility. St. Thomas was so, so good at Northern Colorado. He's very versatile. Again, Eric Musselman, for all of his strengths and weaknesses in terms of transfer portal classes and uh, success that we've seen on the court, he does develop NBA talent quite well. And I think we're going to see St. Thomas display the skill sets necessarily t- necessary to be a player potentially as high as the first round in this upcoming NBA draft class. There's already buzz around St. Thomas right now. You you look him up, you're going to see a lot of draft early, early 2025 draft classes or draft articles talking about St. Thomas. Uh, I think the the Northern Colorado connection probably helps, but ultimately I I think he's a player who, who among a lot of players that I think are going to put themselves on the draft radar out of this transfer class for the entire conference, uh, St. Thomas feels like a very, very uh, likely choice to be in that conversation. And our honorable mention there for most likely NBA draft pick is Kylan Boswell from Indiana going over to Illinois. And Andy, you know, I mean, it's the same thing. Last year, we saw a player kind of leave the Caleb Love experience, wound up as the ACC player of the year. I know it was actually Caleb Love leaving him, but can the same be true for Kylan Boswell to get out on his own a little bit? Andy, what we need to see from him is more consistency. We move now to our sophomore breakout and our two choices here, we we kind of flopped back and forth between two now teammates who mm-hmm. we talked about earlier in Ohio State's class. But our choice here is Aaron Bradshaw. That's why we didn't have him for our NBA draft pick. Aaron Bradshaw, sophomore breakout. Again, healthy offseason this time around. We think he should be an absolute dude at Ohio State. Yeah, and Sean Stewart's the honorable mention there. And I, I'm again, the Ohio State class really interests me. And while I'm interested in, in how Michi Johnson does coming back to the program, while I'm interested in seeing Micah Parrish in a new system, the main intrigue is whether we see Stewart and Bradshaw playing a lot of minutes together, whether they replace each other on the floor. They have different skill sets, but also we just didn't see a ton of them at the D1 level last year. Uh, Bradshaw for injury, Stewart just didn't get a, a bunch of run for Duke. So it'll be really interesting to see how those two guys are utilized. But I think they're both strong candidates to have breakout years as sophomores. Uh, we had another honorable mention here that we just we couldn't find a spot for him, but I wanted to shout out Eric Daly. I think he's going to be a really nice piece for Mick Cronin and UCLA coming over from Oklahoma State. He's not as much a breakout. He averaged nine and five last year in the Big 12 as a freshman. So it, he was already really good as a freshman, but I think he's going to, to be a really, really good player for Mick Cronin's team. And I think we wanted to, to make sure we get a mention on him here as well. Yes, absolutely. Andy, we're going to our dark horse candidate and we're going from UCLA to Nebraska. So we're kind of staying in the Big 10 and that's <laughs> yeah. Berka. Buk Tunsil, uh, who leaves Mick Cronin's program. I always like hiccup every time I say his name. I don't do very well with it. I'm sorry, <laughs> Berka. I apologize to you. And then our honorable mention here, Andy, coming from the West Coast Conference mm-hmm. uh, to Washington, so staying out on the West Coast, is Tyler Harris. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Bayek Tunsil. I think he brings uh... – he can be that floor spacing six foot nine kind of stretch stretch four for Nebraska. I think he 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 could be in the NBA draft conversation as well, um, but he's not as well known. So I think he fits well as a dark horse. Tyler Harris, I already talked about him uh, doing the Moses Wood thing, going from Portland to Washington. Worked well for Moses Wood. Very curious to see uh, how he does at Washington. Uh, we we kind of created a new category here for the Big Ten in particular because I wanted an excuse to talk about Wesley Yates. So that's uh, not sophomore breakout, 
but redshirt freshman breakout uh, because Wesley Yates did not play last year at Washington, but he was a top 50 prospect in the 2023 class. High upside guard, lots of potential there. Knee injury limited him to not getting a chance to get on the floor for the Huskies, but he's one of the 11 players that transferred to USC. I'm not sure what his role is going to look like as a freshman. There is a distinct possibility that he is a borderline rotation player, not getting a lot of minutes. So he might end up being a redshirt sophomore breakout candidate, uh, but he's definitely a name to keep an eye on who's not getting a ton of attention, but I think could be somebody who, if, if given the opportunity for Mus's team, could, could really turn some heads. Andy, our final superlative today is the Fool Me Twice Award, and this goes to TJ Bamba, who goes from Villanova to Oregon. Andy, his junior year had a kind of breakout at Washington State, 15.8 points a game. And coming to Villanova, I don't, I don't remember how you felt, but I had talked myself into him just being an absolute stud at Villanova last mm-hmm. year. And I'll say this. He was fine. He was solid. 10 points a game, shot 82% from the free throw line, 37% from three, 3.6 boards, 1.8 assists for the 6'5 guard. And I I just think, you know, it's like a combination of his size and Mm. everything else he can do there. And so I'm hopeful that TJ Bamba going from Villanova to Oregon will have uh, kind of that year that we wanted for him at Villanova. And it's his last chance, Andy, because it's year five. Yeah, it'll be interesting. If he really does have a a much better season at Oregon, I think that that's going to reflect somewhat poorly on Kyle Neptune at Villanova, which he doesn't need any more poor attention or negative attention. Uh, And and yeah, Bamba was his efficiency numbers were basically the same as they were as his breakout year. He just had a bit of a smaller role, but for a Villanova team that wasn't very good last year, having TJ Bamba put up efficient, productive numbers, but not be as uh, involved in the offense is, is kind of a concern for, for what happened there. I'm curious how Oregon ends up deploying him on their, on their roster, but he could be a, a very nice piece for the Ducks. That's going to wrap up today's show. If you haven't subscribed on audio and video, make sure you do that. Very easy. Helps make sure that you catch every episode. If you're not joined the Locked On College Basketball Discord community, as Andy said earlier, the link is in the show notes and it's absolutely free to join so that you can talk college basketball all the time. Tomorrow, we're going to wrap up the week talking about the SEC transfer class. And don't forget, transfer week is not over. It's like transfer week plus one as next Monday, we'll talk about the best of the rest. Oh, man, it's good to be in the Big Ten because we get to say apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go Wildcats, although we didn't talk Northwestern today. We'll be back with you tomorrow. But until then, peace.